Welcome to the world of numerical analysis. I am Professor Sachin Patwardhan from Department of Chemical Engineering at uh, IIT Bombay. And these are series of lectures delivered on advanced numerical analysis in NPTEL phase 2. So, this is my first lecture, this is an overview of the course and next one hour or so, I am going to present a bird's eye view of what we are going to study in this course. World of numerical analysis is pretty involved and complex and probably some of you have already have some introduction to this. This is meant to be a course which is a advanced course will introduce you many of the things in a different light and I hope it will help you throughout your uh, academic career. So, let us begin uh, our journey with the motivation. In chemical plants, it can you know you have large number of interconnected units like heat exchangers, reactors, distillation columns and these days the chemical plants are very tightly integrated to achieve high energy efficiency or high material efficiency, which makes it very complex to handle, to operate, to design and it is not possible to do it without doing mathematical modeling. So, design and operation of such complex plant is always a challenging problem and mathematical modeling and simulation has become a very, very handy tool, a very cost effective method of analyzing behavior of such plants. So, in a real design problem or a real operation problem, we have to judiciously blend mathematical analysis with experiments. It is not possible to rely only on experiments. It will be uh, not correct to rely only on mathematical modeling. What we have to do is to plan experiments very carefully using mathematical models. So, mathematical modeling has become a backbone of modern chemical engineering design and operation. Now, these models have to be solved either offline or online and when you have to solve these models under variety of conditions, variety of problems, you need to use numerical tools. Most often you cannot solve these problems analytically. So, numerical problems is at the or numerical solutions is at the heart of uh, mathematical modeling and simulation, which is in effect used for designing and operating chemical plants. Now, what are the typical problems that we encounter? Let us look at some of the problems that a chemical engineer would typically have to face when he goes to a chemical plant. Well, one problem is of course, uh, a design problem. You may have to design a new section of a plant or if you are part of a uh, consulting firm which design chemical plants, you have to uh, design a new plant under you know you are given some desired product composition, you are given some raw material availability and then you have to find out unit sizes, you have to find out flow rates, you have to find out operating conditions. So, coming up with a base design from which a mechanical engineer or other engineering departments can take over is what is the job of a chemical engineer coming up with the basic uh, flow sheet uh, design. Uh, so, this normally involves uh, models for different unit operations. You have to uh, connect all these models into a, a giant mathematical model into a big uh, model, which could be hundreds and thousands of equations. They need to be solved under variety of conditions. So, this is one of the problems that you normally encounter. The other problem could be that you are already employed in a plant and then you know you have to do process retrofitting. So, retrofitting involves improvement in the existing operating conditions. So, you have a plant which is operating and then uh, some modifications are necessary because maybe the, the, the input conditions have changed 
may be uh, you know the feed quality has changed uh, or you need to ramp up you need to operate the same plant at uh, different conditions than what it was designed for uh, because of the market conditions. So, retrofitting is another problem uh, for an existing plant and uh, a problem that always comes when you are operating plant is control or online optimization. So, uh, dynamic behavior and operate operability analysis is integral part of operating any complex chemical plant. You have to first of all you have to monitor and control the plant, you have to make sure that it is operating safely. You may have to carry out hazard analysis, conduct what if studies, you may want to do online optimization, run the plant in an optimal way and all these exercises cannot be done without mathematical modeling and subsequently solving these mathematical models using numerical analysis. So, numerical analysis is at the heart of uh, all these exercises that we have to undertake as a chemical engineer. Now, what are mathematical models? Mathematical models could be in different forms. We have models that give insight into long term behavior. So, these are typically energy and material balances and we look at the steady state conditions. In the design problems or in retrofitting problems, you might want to only restrict yourself to steady state uh, models. That means, we ignore the transient behavior or short term behavior. Whereas, when you are studying operation of a plant, when you are try trying to control a plant, you cannot ignore the dynamics. So, in that situation, the short term behavior or the transients become very, very important. And then we have to we have to uh, solve the mathematical models in time and possibly time and space. Okay. So, what kind of mathematical models that we are going to study or what that we need in this particular course? Mostly these models are going to be coming from first principles or they are from uh, or they are often called as mechanistic models or phenomenological models. So, these models come from you know mass balances, component balances. So, this is something that you have been doing uh, for as a, as a you know in your courses in various courses in chemical engineer engineering. So, this could be you know uh, models are composed out of you know rate equations, uh, mass, heat or momentum transfer, uh, there are constitutive equations, then uh, chemical uh, reaction rate equations. There could be equilibrium principles used while doing a modeling between different phases. Um, also, uh, you may have to use equations of state um, if uh, for systems involve uh, gases or multiple phases. Uh, so, the models that you actually use for doing this design operation, dynamic simulation uh, are quite complex they are uh, constructed out of these fundamental concepts of energy mass material balances rate equations and uh, equilibrium uh, models well from a mathematical viewpoint how do i classify these models well we can have variety of classifications but uh, one classification that is relevant uh, to this course which will of course uh, show up in a different way uh, in terms of uh, classes of model equations that we investigate uh, is into uh, distributed parameter models and lump parameter models. So, by this classification you know we are looking at uh, two classes one that uh, deals with um, variation in time and space. So, distributed parameter models capture relationship between different variables uh, not just uh, in space, but also in time. When I say space it could be in multiple dimensions not just single dimension. So, for example, plug flow reactor or a packed bed column or even a shell and tube head exchanger can be modeled as a distributed parameter system. So, this will depend upon uh, a situation in some cases you might use very very simple lump parameter model for a shell and tube head exchanger but there are situations where you may want to use more complex 
uh, distributed parameter model. So one class of models that we are going to encounter in this course are distributed parameter models. The other class of models which we very often study in uh, chemical engineering are lump parameter models. For example, uh, stirred tank reactors or many stage unit operations, mixers. So these are models with the with ignoring uh, you know spatial variation and if necessary we only consider variation in time alone. So um, if you are looking at transient behavior only time comes into picture. If you are uh, looking at steady state behavior you may get uh, only algebraic equations in this case. So these are two broad classes of models that uh, are encountered in chemical engineering and we are going to uh, study these models. We are going to study how to solve uh, different uh, subclasses belonging to this two broad classes of models. Well, if we examine from a mathematical viewpoint, what are the equation forms that we encounter when we are going to uh, do this course? Well, when you do a course in mathematics or let us say courses in mathematics in your first or second year uh, of engineering, uh, we start looking at only abstract equation forms and it is important that you relate those abstract equation forms to what you see in the mathematical models. So what are kind of equation forms that you commonly encountered in uh, chemical engineering models? Well one is linear algebraic equations where we study linear algebraic equations maybe even before we enter an engineering program. What uh, you study as you enter an engineering program in chemical engineering is uh, solving nonlinear algebraic equations. So very often we have to uh, deal with a single variable or multivariable uh, nonlinear algebraic equations. Thermodynamic relationships, for example, are many times uh, nonlinear equations. The other class of problems that you encounter uh, in modeling chemical engineering unit operations is uh, ordinary differential equations. Typically an initial value is given and then we are supposed to find a solution of first, second, third or higher order ordinary differential equation. The other class of problems that are encountered particularly in distributed parameter systems are differential equations uh, with boundary value problems. You also may have equations which are differential and algebraic equations. So differential algebraic systems DAEs. Uh, so this is differential algebraic systems are mixtures of algebraic and differential equations while ordinary differential equations boundary value problems are one in which boundary conditions are specified partially at one boundary and the remaining at the other boundary and we are expected to solve these kind of uh, differential equations. So these kind of problems typically arise while solving say plug flow reactor uh, models or distributed parameter systems. And other models that we often encounter while modeling uh, chemical engineering unit uh, operations are partial differential equations. So these models they may not come in isolation in real problem when you are actually trying to solve uh, a problem associated with a section of a chemical plant you may get mixture of all of them not just one of them in isolation. Nevertheless, when we study these uh, equation forms, we often study them in isolation and then uh, we understand how to attack more complex problems where uh, a combination of these might be encountered. Now how do you go about doing this? How do you go about um, studying these equation forms? Well, if you look at many of the uh, approaches presented in uh, textbooks uh, written for engineers, a conventional approach is study numerical recipes for each type of equations. That means you start by saying well I am going to first look at linear algebraic equations and the tools for solving linear algebraic equations. Then uh, we move on to uh, say nonlinear algebraic equations having studied linear and nonlinear algebraic equations we uh, look at ordinary differential equations. Uh, then 
initial value problems typically you begin with. Then you might uh, want to move on to study uh, ordinary differential equations with boundary values and then typically a course would end with set of partial differential equations. So methods for partial differential equations, methods for ordinary differential equations and so on. So if we look at it from this viewpoint, uh, one can get uh, a view that there are separate methods for solving linear equations and for partial differential equations or boundary value problems. But this is not uh, exactly so when you start looking at uh, these methods from a different viewpoint. So in the conventional approach how do you where do you encounter all these applications? So we after we have studied uh, each one of these uh, equation types that is numerical methods for solving each one of these equation types then in exercises or in the in the sample examples you will encounter real engineering problems or it could be you might you might come across some abstract problems in terms of some x y z variables which do not make physical sense. Uh, so these problems uh, are then used uh, to form up the concept that you have studied for each equation type. In this course on advanced numerical analysis we are going to be different we are going to look at it in a uh, completely different manner. So what I am going to do is I am interested in understanding what are the fundamental steps involved in formulation of a numerical scheme and then how do you come up with uh, a receipt or uh, a solution approach to solve a particular problem. So if you if you if you take a critical viewpoint of all the methods then you come across certain threads which are common and from that you can actually build a, a different way of studying numerical analysis. So what I am going to do here is uh, you know look at two different steps separately. Uh, if you look at all the numerical methods uh, that are used for solving um, you know uh, different type of problems that are encountered and uh, you know make an analysis what kind of uh, what is the first step and what is the second step. So what you what you realize is that invariably a first step is uh, you know model transformation. So many times you have models uh, that cannot be directly uh, or many times you have mathematical problems that cannot be directly solved using uh, existing methods when I mean to say that cannot be directly solved I mean to say that they cannot be analytically solved. If they cannot be analytically solved you have to construct approximation approximate solutions but to construct approximate solutions you have to first convert a given problem into a computable form. A computable form is one to which known computation tools can be applied. Now this problem transformation is carried out using uh, tools or using approaches developed in uh, approximation theory a well developed branch of applied mathematics. Approximation theory is used to transform a problem into computable form and then you actually use different tools to attack the transform problem and construct a numerical solution. So these tools are you know linear algebraic equation solver or nonlinear algebraic equation solver it could be uh, ordinary differential equation initial value problem solver or it could be a numerical optimization scheme. So when you actually construct a receipt or when you uh, construct a numerical scheme to solve a problem you first transform it into uh, a form that can be uh, dealt with that can be tackled with one of one of the standard tools and then you uh, use one or more of these tools in combination to come up with a solution of the transform problem. So this is if I just put this 
into a pictorial form. Then you have an original problem. This original problem might be a partial differential equation. Then you take this original problem, use principles developed in the approximation theory and transform it to a, what I have called here in a standard form. A standard form is what I mean by, by a standard form here is a computable form. Okay. So, this, this original form might be a partial differential equation. When I transform it, it might turn out to be set of linear algebraic equations or set of nonlinear algebraic equations. So, the original problem that you want to solve and the transform problem do not have same equation type. You have, uh, you have a partial differential equation here, you have a set of nonlinear algebraic equations here. So, to solve these nonlinear algebraic equations, you may have to use, uh, you may have to use special tools that are uh, developed for solving nonlinear algebraic equations. These tools for solving nonlinear algebraic equations, in turn, might use uh, a linear algebraic equation solver. So, so you know, it's not that I'm going to use just one tool. So, I'm going to use multiple of these tools to attack this transfer pro transform problem and then come up with a solution which is a numerical solution of my uh, original problem. So, what we are going to study in this course is uh, two steps. Well, how do I take the original problem and transform it into uh, a solvable form or a computable form. Now, this process actually uh, in the conventional approach get mixed up with various uh, you know receipts that are developed for specific equation types. We are going to separate it and view it uh, as a separate step. So, this, this means uh, unlike the conventional approach, I am not going to look at partial differential equations at the end of my course or boundary value problems at the end of my course. I will begin right in uh, you know uh, attacking these problems right in the beginning and we will just transform them into forms that can be solved using one or more of these standard tools. So, that is the approach that we want to take. So, what are the overall learning objectives for this numerical analysis course? Okay. Well, I am assuming here that uh, you have had some some exposure to this uh, numerical methods prior to doing this course. Well, if you have not had does not matter. Uh, this course will give you, uh, you know from scratch uh, a different viewpoint of numerical analysis. But if you have had some uh, prior experience with numerical analysis, well it will enrich your understanding. So, the first thing that I want to do here is to clearly bring out the role of approximation theory in the process of developing a numerical receipt for solving an engineering problem. This, this word uh, is, uh, you know, I am deliberately using this word numerical receipt. It is like, you know, at the end of the course, you should realize that uh, forming a numerical scheme is like uh, cooking up uh, some dish. And, you know, if you know the basic ingredients, you can actually uh, combine uh, and then come up with uh, a particular dish. So, you, you often have to be a good cook to come up with a numerical receipt to solve a problem and to be a good cook, you have to understand the foundations. So, the first step is uh, you know problem transformation, which is, um, which is based on the approximation theory. The next step is of course, uh, solving it, but in solving it, there are two aspects. One is of course, the algebraic aspect of the problem. How do you actually uh, write the algorithms and so on. But often, there are very, very interesting geometric ideas associated with these numerical schemes. And if you get, if you get understanding of these geometric ideas, if you understand, uh, you know, uh, if you can visualize some of these um, if, if, if you can use your uh, you know power of visualization, then actually uh, that can help you to construct solutions much better. So, unlike 
a traditional course, I would like to stress a lot on explaining many geometric ideas that are associated with development of numerical schemes. So, this will actually help in developing a deeper understanding of uh, numerical recipes and finally, an aspect that we uh, do not try to stress in the first course is uh, analysis of convergence or convergence analysis of numerical methods or error analysis. Uh, there are also other analytical aspects that are associated with the numerical computations and I would like to stress these um, numerical uh, these aspects along with the numerical aspects, convergence aspects along with the numerical aspects. Though we may not get too much deep into these, but we will nevertheless uh, study this to some extent, so that you have a taste of uh, what goes in, uh, you know, uh, understanding uh, the convergence behavior of these schemes. So all these three aspects are very very important when it comes to coming up or when, when it comes to concocting a new uh, numerical scheme. So, if you take a, a critical look at many, many uh, numerical schemes that are available in the most of the textbooks, you will see that uh, you know there are some fundamental two or three ideas that are used in developing the computable forms. Okay. Uh, one of them, one dominant idea that is uh, you find in uh, numerical uh, methods is using Taylor series expansion. So, approximations carried around carried using Taylor series expansion is one dominant uh, way of doing uh, approximation. The other method or other approach that is used is polynomial interpolations and the third uh, you know pillar of approximation uh, or problem simplification, problem discretization is uh, least squares approximations. So, the problem transformation is carried out mainly uh, using these three fundamental uh, tools or fundamental ideas. One is Taylor series expansion, other is polynomial interpolation and uh, least square approximation and we are going to study them pretty much in detail, so as to understand their role in problem transformations. Then after that, we are going to get in depth understanding of four different numerical tools. Well, once you have transformed the problems, there are variety of ways of attacking the problem uh, to get a numerical solution. So, uh, if you look at what are the tools available today, well we can come up with five different classifications. I have just mentioned four of them here. One is uh, linear algebraic equations, other is nonlinear algebraic equation, uh, ordinary differential equations, initial value problem and numerical optimizations. So, I need these four toolkits with me to come up with a numerical scheme and then the fifth one which is not mentioned here or which is not going to be part of uh, this course is stochastic methods that goes much beyond scope of this particular course uh, and would probably need a separate course to see how stochastic methods can be used to solve uh, the transform problem. We are going to concentrate mainly on linear algebraic equations, nonlinear algebraic equations and ordinary differential equations initial value problems or ODE IVP as they are known. Along our way, we will also pick up fundamentals of numerical optimization. I do not intend to have a separate module on numerical optimization, but we will on our way, we will pick up uh, tools on numerical optimization. So, this course consists of six learning modules. The first one uh, actually uh, here I am talking of the, the course ideally what it should consist of. Um, well, I will then at the end of this slide, I will tell you what I am going to lecture on, but this course initially should begin with uh, 
relating abstract equation forms to process models. Okay, so we, uh, if I if I am delivering this course to uh, final year undergraduate students, I would spend first two or three lectures talking about different mathematical models that they have already studied and what abstract equation forms that arise from these mathematical models. The second module is going to be completely different from what you uh, do in the conventional numerical methods or numerical analysis course. The few lectures, the, these few lectures are going to be devoted to fundamentals of vector spaces. Now, vector spaces, we start studying vector spaces probably uh, even before we enter uh, our uh, engineering programs. So, by the time we come into engineering programs, we are familiar with three dimensional vector spaces and mostly, mostly we continue using three dimensional vector spaces. Maybe you study, uh, you know, uh, different coordinate systems, which probably you do not study when you are in your school, but uh, more or less the idea of vector space remains confined to three dimensional vector spaces. But in uh, mathematics, in the field of functional analysis, the idea of vector spaces has been very, very uh, profoundly developed into uh, you know, a rich concept where uh, a large subset of uh, objects can be looked upon as vector spaces and we are going to get some peak some uh, um, you know understanding of these generalized vector spaces which are not just three dimensional vector spaces but four five n dimensional or even infinite dimensional vector spaces in fact these vector spaces play uh, a fundamental role in formulation of uh, or in understanding of numerical schemes and this is what I mean when I when I am saying that I want to stress upon geometric ideas. The geometric ideas that you understand in three dimensions can be extended to uh, spaces of higher dimension and that is what we are going to have a peek at in uh, the second module. Uh, the third module is going to be problem discretization using approximation theory. So, uh, a significant number of lectures are going to be devoted to problem transformations. So, here uh, you know I will uh, start with the models which, which could be uh, a nonlinear set of algebraic equations, which could be a partial differential equation, which could be a ordinary differential equation, boundary value problem. I am going to transform it into a computable form. So, unlike a conventional course where these uh, PDEs or boundary value problems are discussed at the end, we will encounter them right in the beginning of this course and we will transform to the computable forms. Once we have the standard computable forms, which could be set of linear algebraic equations, which could be set of nonlinear algebraic equations or ordinary differential equations, initial value problems, then we need to know how to solve them. So, module 4 is going to look at variety of numerical tools <coughs> for solving linear algebraic equations. Then we move on to tools for solving nonlinear algebraic equations and finally, we end with tools for solving ordinary differential equations initial value problems. So, ideally this course should consist of these six modules well, but when I am going to deliver these set of lectures, I am assuming that you are already well familiar with different uh, model forms that you encounter in chemical engineering. So, the module 1 though I have mentioned here, uh, I am not going to really start with module 1. My lectures will start with module 2 that is fundamentals of vector spaces. In the next few slides, I will very briefly touch upon what should go into module 1, but uh, the second lecture onwards will start looking at vector spaces, generalized vector spaces and how, what role they play in numerical analysis. Okay. So, moving on, uh, 
well, how, how long will this journey be? It's, it's going to be a long journey. We would need about 48 lectures, one hour lectures to uh, understand uh, these uh, variety of aspects of numerical analysis. So, let me uh, get into a little more details of module 1. So, the module 1 will consist of abstract equation forms in process modeling. So, overall objective would be you know uh, mathematical models in chemical engineering together with variety of design or operating conditions. They give rise to different types of abstract equations or equation forms like ODEs, like partial differential equations. And so, we must in the beginning associate abstract forms with a real problem because as we go along, we just start looking at abstract forms, we lose track of the uh, engineering problems except when we look at some uh, you know examples or when we look at uh, or when we solve some exercises. Apart from that, we, uh, we lose connection with the engineering problems. So, in the beginning, it is good to have a connection with these models. Uh, and then we need to know which, which type of equation forms will be treated through the uh, in this course. Uh, so, if you just want to have commonly encountered examples, so linear algebraic equations, where do you get linear algebraic equations in chemical engineering systems. So, uh, many, many times we have to solve steady state material balance for a, a lump parameter model for a section of a plant. Uh, and this will give rise to set of linear algebraic equations A x equal to B. Uh, Nonlinear algebraic equations, of course, you must have studied uh, in your courses in your third year when you study, uh, you know, mass transfer, heat transfer uh, courses or unit operation courses mainly, where uh, we encounter models which come through energy and material balance uh, for one unit or a section of a plant which consists of multiple units, and these give rise to nonlinear algebraic equations. Uh, very often, we have to uh, solve uh, problems using optimization tools. For example, uh, estimating uh, some rate parameters say reaction kinetics parameters or estimation of mass transfer or heat transfer correlations. So, these, these problems have to be solved using tools uh, that are used for optimization, numerical optimization. So, these are optimization based formulations and uh, ordinary differential equations initial value problems arise uh, when you start looking at uh, control at dynamic simulation of a chemical plant or when you want to do HAZOP analysis using dynamics, dynamic simulators. So, uh, these problems in abstract terms are nothing but solving coupled ordinary differential equations subject to given initial conditions or given input scenarios. Then you may end up with not just differential equations, you may end up with algebraic differential equations. Well, common example is distillation columns where you have a phase equilibrium giving rise to algebraic equations which could be highly nonlinear. You have differential equations coming from uh, dynamics on the trays, temperature dynamics, composition dynamics, material balance on the trays. Uh, if you want to simulate the dynamic behavior, not just do the design, then you get differential algebraic equations, coupled equations and these equa equations are notoriously difficult to solve than the differential equations alone or algebraic equations alone. So, uh, these are the situations where uh, you know these, these differential algebraic equations arise when you have um, phenomena which are operating at different time scales. So, some phenomena are fast, some phenomena are, uh, are slow and in such situations the slow phenomena you retain them as differential equations, the fast phenomena you can neglect the derivatives and uh, you know ap approximate those uh, equations associated with those equations as algebraic equations and that gives rise to differential algebraic equations. If you want to do detailed analysis of let us say some uh, reactor plug flow reactor 
or a packed bed column, then you do not have option but to use partial differential equations. Uh, whereas, uh, when you are doing a very gross analysis in a uh, taking it just as a unit in a plant and doing energy material balance, you can probably neglect those variations. But if you want to study one unit operation in detail, you often have to use uh, you know distributed parameter models that is partial differential equations. So, uh, these partial differential equations arise when you are looking at packed bed columns, flux flow reactors and so on. So, uh, in the beginning it is good to make these associations to understand where these abstract equation forms arise, but as I said my lectures are going to start from module 2, uh, because these are meant for um, somewhat advanced users. In the final year of uh, a chemical engineering undergraduate program or maybe first year of a graduate program of chemical engineering. Well, here we begin with fundamentals of vector spaces. So, what are the learning objectives? So, first thing is I would like to uh, understand two fundamental operations vector addition and vector and scalar multiplication and see how these operations hold in any vector space. What do I mean by any vector space? I am going to define sets which are called as vector spaces where uh, these two operations hold and these sets are going to be other than the familiar three dimensional vector spaces. For example, I would introduce set of continuous functions over some domain say 0 to 1 or I might introduce I might start talking about a set of continuous functions over 0 to infinity. These kind of functions these kind of uh, sets arise when we are solving differential equations partial differential equations and if you have understanding basic understanding or of the geometric understanding of <coughs> these uh, underlying spaces, then it is much easier to develop uh, the solutions for uh, these kind of equations. So, we are going to look at uh, these abstract notions of vector space and generalized vector spaces like uh, function spaces. So, a vector in this uh, vector space is a function. For example, uh, you know set of all continuous functions over 0 to 2 pi okay. and say sin x is a vector in this uh, set or cos x or cos 2 x is a vector in this in, in this uh, set of continuous functions. Well, another vector could be just a line a plus b t defined over 0 to 2 pi and so on or some polynomial defined over 0 to 2 pi. So, so these sets are generalized sets, uh, not just three dimensional vector spaces that you are familiar with. And what we will study in this particular module is how these sets do qualify uh, to be called as uh, vector spaces and how the geometric ideas that hold in three dimensions can be extended to these uh, higher dimensional spaces. So, we will go on to generalize the concepts such as subspace, such as linear dependence, such as span of vectors what is the basis in a vector space and so on and we will examine examples of different sets that qualify to be vector spaces or that qualify to be subspace of a vector space and so on. So, this is this is a beginning of the geometric generalization. This grand geometric generalization was carried out uh, probably 60, 70, 80, 100 years back uh, in the domain of mathematics. And if you have some idea about these generalizations, then it becomes very, very easy to understand uh, underlying foundations of numerical analysis. So, that is why first few lectures are going to be devoted to understanding these generalized sets. Well, when we work in a three dimensional vector space, what are the things that you actually need? Well, we need when you work with vectors, we need to know about uh, length of the vector. Okay. <coughs> so, when you when you move on to generalize vector spaces, we define 
something called norm of a vector which could be viewed as a generalization of concept of uh, length of a vector. So, we are going to distill out essential properties that define length in three dimensions and generalize them to this concept of norms. Is there a unique way of defining a norm? What we will find out is that a norm can be defined in multiple ways. Okay. The way we define the so called length in three dimensions is one way of defining norm, it is a special case. Now, <coughs> it is good to do visualizations in three dimensions or two dimensions one can do visualizations. And maybe if you understand visualizations in two and three dimensions, then you might be at least uh, able to do some imagination and uh, or extend your imagination to see what, what is uh, happening in a higher dimensional space or a function space. So, that is what we are going to look at uh, in this part. Well, when you are dealing with uh, numerical analysis, a thing that you have to uh, you, you invariably encounter is convergence of a numerical scheme. So, we have to understand uh, whether a particular we start with a guess solution and we construct a new solution from a initial solution. So, whether this sequence of vectors that you get in the process of generating uh, approximate solutions, is it converging to some, some point? Is it, is, it, is it going to somewhere, is it going somewhere in the same space? We, we need to examine this, this uh, thoroughly when it comes to understanding numerical behavior of, of solutions. So, in abstract terms, we are going to look at sequences of vectors okay, and we also have to talk about convergence. In fact, when you have to talk of convergence of vectors, we have to talk of nearness of two vectors and if you want to talk of nearness of two vectors, you have to find out distance between the two vectors and this is where the concept of norm becomes very, very vital. So, the ideas that you use in three dimensions need to be generalized to uh, higher dimensions. Well, we will look at very briefly at the concept of a normed space that means a space on which a norm is defined. So, and we will also have a uh, uh, you know, we will also understand very briefly what are called as Banach spaces or the complete norm spaces. Uh, well, these spaces you may not encounter later, the concept of Banach space may not be required throughout the course, but it's, it is it's good to have uh, understanding of uh, this idea when we uh, start looking at, uh, when you start generalizing uh, the concept of a vector space. The most important concept that we use in three dimensions uh, when we do geometry in three dimensions is orthogonality. Okay. We, we like to work with uh, orthogonal sets, we like to work with uh, you know coordinate, uh, coordinate definitions which are orthogonal to each other x, y, z or you know coordinates that we normally take are you know is a orthogonal coordinate system. So, orthogonality that is so useful in three dimensions is also useful when it goes to other spaces like function spaces. Okay. So, we need to generalize the concept of orthogonality to higher dimensional spaces to other spaces and this is done through what is called as inner products. So, we are going to define a special class of spaces vector spaces called as inner product spaces. Okay. That is a vector space a set of objects on which an inner product is defined. Well, when it comes to uh, a three dimensional space, all of you would be familiar with a dot product. Okay. So, when I am generalizing the, when I am generalizing the idea of vector space from three dimensions to some other, uh, you know some other sets, which are more general sets, I also would like to have ideas, which are similar to a dot product. Okay. So, this inner product is going to give me something similar to a dot product. In fact, what we will see is that dot product is one way of defining an inner product. So, inner product is a generalization, is a grand generalization, which will help us to uh, generalize the concepts of orthogonality, orthogonal vectors in general spaces, function spaces uh, and so on. So, we are going to look at 
inner product spaces. Inner product spaces are generalization of uh, three dimensional vector spaces with dot product defined in them. So, we are very very familiar with dot product, we use dot product to define angle between two vectors in three dimensions and when we move on to more general spaces set of functions, set of uh, you know polynomials, we need this concept, we need something like dot product which is uh, going to be this inner product uh, in these in these spaces. So, we are going to look at variety of inner product spaces. So, there are different ways of defining inner product not that not only one way in three dimensional space you only know one way of defining an inner product, but there are other ways of defining inner products and we will look at those uh, different methods of defining inner products. Well, one of the fundamental equation that we use in three dimensions is that cos theta angle between any two vectors is dot product of two vectors two unit vectors in two directions. So, if I have a vector a and b, I find out unit vectors in along a, I find a unit vector along b and then I take a dot product which gives me cos theta between a and b. A generalization of this particular uh, concept in inner product spaces is nothing but the so called Cauchy Schwarz inequality. The, the name Cauchy Schwarz inequality might sound very intimidating, but uh, this is a very fundamental result in inner product spaces and it will help us to define angle between two vectors. So, here a vector as I said is going to be uh, a function and then we need to talk about orthogonal functions. Okay. So, so see you might have come across uh, some statements in your uh, undergraduate education saying that sin theta, sin 2 theta, sin 3 theta these are orthogonal to each other. Why they are orthogonal? Okay. So, if you understand the concept of inner products and inner product spaces, this will no longer be a mystery. Okay. So, generalization of concept of angle between <coughs> any two vectors is achieved through inner product and then the Cauchy Schwarz inequality is a fundamental inequality which is nothing but generalization of the fact that cos theta is uh, dot product of two vectors through unit vectors in, in three dimensions. Okay. So, we are going to uh, study this Cauchy Schwarz inequality, then we will look at variety of orthogonal or orthonormal sets that are very often used in numeric analysis. For example, Legendre polynomial or a Laguerre polynomial. Now, these, these names we encountered in uh, maths courses and often uh, we do not know why they are they are called orthogonal uh, sets or why they are called as orthogonal polynomials. Uh, if you if you start from fundamentals of vector spaces, you will get in depth understanding as why these sets are called as orthogonal uh, sets. Well, it is not always that you have a set of vectors which are orthogonal. Okay. But if you have a non orthogonal set of vectors, then one can systematically construct a set of vectors that is orthogonal. Uh, for example, in three dimensions, you may have come across this method called Gram Schmidt orthogonalization, okay, which is you start with three vectors which are not orthogonal, and starting from these vectors, one can systematically construct three new vectors which are orthogonal to each other. Okay. So, constructing an orthogonal set from a non orthogonal set. This process is called gram schmidt orthogonalization and this we are going to study in a general inner product space. It will be very useful to get again insight into how different uh, orthogonal sets are developed and then we will look at uh, examples of generating orthogonal sets starting from non orthogonal sets. So, <coughs> from inner product spaces uh, we then move on to the third module. Now, this is going to be a very, very important module in this uh, course, uh, I would say heart of this course. How do you discretize the problem using approximation theory? So, as I told you in the beginning, 
it is often not possible to uh, solve a given problem in its original form. Most of the times the problem that you have is not a linear which means it could consist of non-linear algebraic equations, non-linear differential equations, non-linear partial differential equations. Well, when you have linear differential equations, linear partial differential equations, you can many times construct solutions analytically at least for some idealized situations. This becomes uh, very, very difficult even if there are slight nonlinearities and it may not be possible to have uh, analytical solutions. This means you have to construct numerical solutions. To construct numerical solutions, we have to first transform into uh, standard forms. See, this is because we do not have tools to solve all kinds of problems. We can only tackle certain types of equation forms. So, first step is to convert a given problem into a problem which can be tackled using standard tools. Okay. And then we, we uh, attack the problem to construct a solution. Okay. So, by hook or crook, by some means, by using multiple ideas together uh, from approximation theory, we actually transform the problem to uh, a computable form. Is there a unique way of doing this? Obviously not. A given problem can be transformed into a computable form by variety of means. And if you have to choose between different means of transformation, you have to have in-depth understanding of how these transformations are done. Why do you choose one over the other, whether I should use uh, Taylor series approximation or whether I should use interpolation. Unless you know the foundations, it is difficult to make these choices. So, it is good to have a basis, a foundation of uh, you know the approximation theory. Uh, this step of model transformation is often referred to as problem discretization. And in this module, in this set of lectures, we are going to look at uh, popular approaches that are available in the literature for approximations or approximate a given problem um, to computable forms. So, uh, first thing that I want to do here before I begin this transformation is to show that actually different problems that you encounter in uh, numerical analysis, they are only seemingly different. Once you, once you start viewing these problems from the uh, viewpoint of vector spaces, generalized vector spaces, they do not really appear different problems. One can come up with a grand generalization that there is a one single problem. Well, in a particular vector space, this problem will be called as set of algebraic equations. In a particular vector space, in another kind of vector space, a similar problem will be called as uh, solving differential equations, initial value problems. In some other vector space, this problem will be called as uh, a problem which is uh, partial differential equation. Okay. So, if you, if, you, if you understand this grand generalization very briefly, then it helps us to develop uh, discretization in a better way into the computable forms. So, basic problem you can show is that uh, is nothing but a uh, operator operating on a vector giving another vector and there are three problems associated with these, these uh, this fundamental equation is either given the operator and a vector find the solution. So, given operator uh, say t operating on a vector x find y. Uh, the second problem that you encounter is given uh, operator t and y find x. That means, I know the solution, I want I know the I know the effect, I want to find out the cause. So, operator t when it operates on x gives me y, I know y, I know t, I want to find out x. These are called as inverse problems. The first problem where you look at uh, or you are given operator and you are given x, you find out y is called as direct problems. 
uh, our course is mostly going to be dealing with inverse problems. That is, given an operator operating on a vector, and you are given y, the the effect, then you want to find out cause. That is x. Um, then, you know, we will look at specific tools that are used in uh, problem approximation. What what it turns out is that the backbone of approximation is approximating a given function using a set of polynomials. Okay. There is a fundamental theorem in approximation theory called as Weierstrass approximation theorem and this lays the foundation of all the problem discretization methods that are used in numerical analysis. Okay. So, this, this particular theorem states that any continuous function over a finite domain can be approximated with arbitrary degree of accuracy using a set of polynomials. Okay. So, it does not tell you which polynomial to use, it's, it just tells you existence of such a polynomial approximation. Well, it is up to us to construct the polynomial approximations, but uh, the, the study of Weierstrass theorems very briefly will give you, will give you the foundation of how this whole business is done of approximating or how or transforming a problem original problem into a computable form. So, we will just very briefly look at uh, Weierstrass approximation theorem and then we will one by one start looking at commonly used polynomial approximations. Okay. So, which is the most commonly used polynomial approximation? As I said the most commonly used polynomial approximation is uh, Taylor series approximation. So, this is used in variety of numerical tools. Uh, for example, for solving uh, or developing this method called method of finite difference. Method of finite difference is used uh, for discretization of ordinary differential equations, boundary value problems ODE, BVP. They get transformed into a set of algebraic equations. These this method is also used for transforming partial differential equations <coughs> into set of algebraic equations. Okay. So, uh, we will uh, we will also we will also study this method in a different context. For example, you probably are familiar with Newton's method or sometimes called as Newton Raphson method for solving nonlinear algebraic equations and again this method originates uh, from Taylor series approximation that is approximating a nonlinear differential equation or nonlinear set of equations locally using Taylor series and then converting into a set of a sequence of uh, linear algebraic equation problems. So, we will look at Taylor series approximation as a fundamental tool and how it is applied to do problem transformations. A variety of problem transformations transforming a partial differential equation, transforming a boundary value problem, transforming set of nonlinear algebraic equations. Then we continue our journey into other type of approximation. The second most important uh, or not second most important equally important approximation is polynomial interpolations. So, uh, in the beginning, we will have a brief uh, understanding of Lagrange interpolation. Well, it is it's, it's a, it's a large, it is a, a vast area and then we cannot uh, do justice uh, to every aspect of interpolation. I am just going to give you a brief introduction to uh, some important concepts. Uh, so, we will begin with Lagrange interpolation, we will move on to piecewise polynomial approximations or interpolations or not approximations, piecewise polynomial interpolations. And then uh, we will also look at not just polynomial interpolations, we will also look at function interpolations. Okay. So, linearly independent functions are used to construct interpolating, uh, interpolating functions. And then we will look at problem discretization using this approach. So, I am going to again look at a boundary value problem, ordinary differential equation boundary value problem and discretize it using interpolation polynomials or I am going to discretize a boundary value uh, a partial differential equation using uh, interpolation polynomial. So, this is my 
next next task that is study how interpolation plays a role in problem discretization in particular we are going to look at this method of orthogonal collocations uh, which is which is a very powerful method used in uh, solving variety of chemical engineering problems and then uh, have a brief probably look at uh, orthogonal collocations on finite elements so the third important tool or third important approach that is used for problem discretization is least squares so we are going to study various uh, ways of approximating problems using method of least squares uh, first we will develop uh, analytical solution of linear least square problem okay look at its geometric interpretations this will give us insight uh, that is very very uh, valuable that can be uh, you know extended when we uh, understand uh, approximations in higher dimensional spaces and then uh, we will actually extend this idea to uh, general spaces or general hilbert spaces so the fundamental to this uh, least square approximation is the idea of projections now projections we normally study in uh, engineering uh, engineering drawing or we study projections even uh, starting at a school where you want to project uh, find the nearest uh, point in a plane from a given point outside the plane so projections are very very important and how do these idea of projections is used in the problem approximation is what we want to study next so uh, we will also have a brief peek at functional approximation based models and the formulation of the parameter estimation problem and in this before we uh, move on to the uh, the main uh, the other the remaining part that is understanding the tools uh, we will also look at uh, uh, least square prob problems for linear in parameter models least square formulation for non linear in parameter models uh, so in particular we are going to look at a method called gauss newton method so this gauss newton method is um, is a combination of least squares and taylor series so we'll look at this taylor series approximation and least square approximation so we're going to look at this method uh, and then finally move to uh, problem transformations uh, which we have been already looking at that is how do you transform a boundary value problem or how do you discretize a partial differential equation using method of least squares so these methods are known as method of min minimum residual uh, methods so uh, a popular method in this class is gelarkin method and we'll have uh, we'll study this method um, actually the discretization of ordinary differential equations boundary value problems or partial differential equations uh using least square approach leads to the so called finite element methods we will not go in depth into this but we'll have a very brief introduction to what is this uh what is this animal finite element method uh using uh, and how it is related to least square approximations so with this we will come to an end to uh, of uh, our module which talks about problem transformations so this will almost uh, we come to half of the course now what remains to be done is attack the problems which are transformed uh, before that we will very briefly look at what are the errors that come up in problem transformations and uh, what are the approximation errors and what it is bearing on the uh, solutions numerical solutions so after having done this after having transformed the problem now we begin our journey into uh, tools okay the first tool that we are going to look at is solving linear algebraic equations and here well you might wonder we have been solving linear algebraic equations since school days what's so new about it what what am i going to learn about it maybe you are already familiar with uh, gaussian elimination and then in gaussian elimination you may have studied even some advanced uh, things 
like uh, when you know uh, how to do pivoting and so on. Uh, but there is much more to linear equation solving than just Gaussian elimination. Uh, there are many other methods. There are iterative methods for solving uh, linear algebraic equations, and we are going to have uh, uh, look at them. Even optimization methods, based methods, or op numerical optimization based methods are used to solve linear algebraic equations, and we'll be studying those uh, equations. But apart from studying these numerical schemes, I'm going to discuss uh, one very important thing here. Uh, that is matrix conditioning. Matrix conditioning talks about how well posed or how ill posed a given problem is, a given set of linear equations are and then that gives you insight into behavior of the numerical solution. It may happen that you have a <coughs> ill posed problem and then the solution that you compute numerically is not quite reliable. You should be able to differentiate between uh, ill posed problem and not reliable solution and uh, well posed problem, but mistake that you have made in computing the solution. Okay. So, so, this is possible using the concept of condition numbers or matrix conditioning and we are going to have a look at uh, these uh, the concept of condition numbers as a part of this module. So, we will begin with the study of conditions for existence of solutions for linear algebraic equations. We move on to the geometric interpretation of the solutions, very, very important. So, I will look at the problem through two pictures, a row picture and a column picture. Uh, we will we'll look at the solution from a two different viewpoints, geometric viewpoints. Uh, we will interpret the what is the meaning of a singular matrix geometrically. And here, essentially, in the beginning, we will just have a uh, some understanding of four fundamental subspaces associated with a matrix, row space, column space, null space uh, and left null space. <coughs> so, up to now, up to now we were not talking about any numerical scheme we were or solution scheme, we were talking about problem transformation and just now I started about solving linear algebraic equations, but even in the beginning I am talking about geometric ideas and now we will move into numerical schemes. Okay, this is the first time in this course we will be encountering actual numerical schemes. So, first of course, I am going to look at uh, Gaussian elimination very briefly and LU decomposition and <coughs> uh, we will we'll, uh, spend some time on the number of computations that are required in carrying out a Gaussian elimination process and uh, see whether you know. Uh, there are methods that can even improve, that can even reduce the number of computations. Um, so, the main focus in this part is going to be introduction to the iterative methods, uh, but before that we will look at some special methods for solving linear algebraic equations and these are going to be called methods for sparse linear systems. So, many problems have very nice structure, sparse systems are one in which a uh, lot of elements are zeros and there are only few non zero elements in a big matrix in in solving problems which are large scale let's say you are doing simulation of a section of a plant you may have thousands of equations and when you actually uh, start solving them let's say by newton newton's method you linearize them when you linearize them you get linear set of equations which are say 1000 cross 1000 or 10000 cross 10000 but this matrix which is 10,000 cos 10,000 may not be fully populated, it will have many many zeros and it is possible to take advantage of this structure and then uh, come up with special schemes. So, these are called as schemes for sparse linear systems and we are going to look at just few of them. It is a it is a it is an iceberg and we can only touch the tip of the iceberg. So, I am going to look at block diagonal matrices, I am going to uh, present the Thomas algorithm for the tridiagonal matrices and block tridiagonal matrices. Uh, we will look at triangular matrices and block triangular matrices, but as I said this is only a brief introduction and uh, we are going to move on uh, to the iterative schemes. 
the main thing here is to familiarize you with the notion of sparse matrices and then maybe when you encounter them you will remember to use them in your application. The study of iterative solutions of or study of or solving linear algebraic equations using iterative solution scheme is the next component that we will look at. So, there are a variety of iterative schemes you start with a guess solution and then you iteratively refine the solution and finally, you approach the true solution this is the this is the iterative approach and this uh, we are going to study different methods very popular methods in this category are Jacobi method or Gauss Seidel method or the relaxation method. So, we will study these methods their algorithms, but more importantly we will study the convergence analysis of these iterative schemes. I am going to spend quite a bit of time in understanding the convergence of these schemes. The question is if I start with a particular guess what is the guarantee that the solution iterative scheme will converge to the solution of solving linear algebraic equations. So, that will be uh, you know that will be uh, analyzed systematically using concept of eigenvalues and uh, we will see the role of uh, eigenvalues in uh, speed of convergence or the convergence itself. And then we will look at some special form of matrices that enhance convergence. We then move on to optimization based schemes for solving linear algebraic equations. Okay. So, here I am going to use a numerical optimization tool such as gradient search method or conjugate gradient method to solve set of linear algebraic equations that is solving A x equal to B is going to be done using optimization. It turns out that in many situations this can be a very fast tool particularly when you are solving large set of equations. And in the end of this module I am going to understand I am going to present uh, the concept of matrix conditioning or condition number of a matrix and its relationship with behavior of numerical solutions of linear algebraic equations. So, we will end with a deeper understanding into how good or how bad a sol numerical solution is and we will associate that with the conditioning of the matrix. We then move on to the next tool. The next tool uh, that I am going to study is going to be solving nonlinear algebraic equation. So, in this toolbox well uh, nonlinear equations are more often encountered than the real equations. Most of the real engineering problems or real engineering models consist of nonlinear coupled uh, equations. You do not have them in single variables, you have multiple variables which are coupled, which give rise to uh, coupled uh, uh, nonlinear algebraic equations. In a, if you are modeling section of a plant uh, and understanding the steady state behavior of energy and material balance, it might be thousands of coupled. Uh, non-linear algebraic equations that need to be solved simultaneously that is very very important. In this method in this particular module we will uh, look at variety of iterative methods that are used for solving non-linear algebraic equations. Okay. In the end we will also have a brief introduction to the convergence analysis of these methods based on a famous principle in functional analysis called as contraction mapping principle. So, again this is just a brief introduction to let you to tell you that what goes in in understanding the convergence analysis of the scheme. So, we will begin with the method of successive substitutions this is one of the uh, very preliminary method which is used uh, these are derivative free methods. So, there are a variety of derivative free methods uh, like Jacobi iterations or Gauss serial iterations or relaxation iterations we will study these methods and then uh, from this we will move on to derivative based iterative methods. Uh, the well well known derivative based iterative methods are Newton's method. So, we will first look at univariate Newton type methods where you uh, find out the local derivatives either exactly or approximately. Then we, we will formulate a multivariate secant method which is an approximate derivative based method or popularly known as Wegstein iterations. Then we will move on to the 
well known Newton's method uh, and look at its variations like damped Newton method where you can try to improve the convergence behavior or we will develop numerically more friendly uh, versions of uh, Newton's method uh, which are uh, you know called as quasi Newton methods or with rank 1 updates of the Jacobian matrix. The problem with Newton method is that you have to compute derivative matrix Jacobian matrix. If there are n equations and n variables every iteration you have to compute an n cross n matrix and this can be numerically quite complex if you have thousands of equations. This quasi Newton methods allow you to do approximate update of the Jacobian. So, they construct a new Jacobian using the old Jacobian and this way they save computations. So, uh, we are going to have a brief introduction to this quasi Newton methods. We then move on to solving uh, nonlinear uh, algebraic equations using optimization. Optimization, numerical optimization is a powerful uh, tool which is used for solving nonlinear uh, problems, nonlinear uh, algebraic equations. One of the popular method in this class is conjugate gradient method. So, we will have a brief look at conjugate gradient method. This is a gradient based method. There is a Hessian or second order derivative based method which are called in this category they are called as Newton's method. We also have quasi Newton method which are again simplifications of Newton's method or Hessian based methods. So, we will have a brief peek or brief introduction to quasi Newton methods and finally, we will look at a method called Leverberg Marquardt method, which is combination of the gradient method and Newton's method. So, you use gradient when it is helpful to use gradient, you use Hessian when you it is helpful to use Hessian. So, it is a it is a merger of the two methods and we will just understand this. Towards the end, we will just briefly understand the concept of condition number of set of nonlinear equations. You cannot have one condition number, you can define a local concept of condition number here, which is conceptually uh, similar, qualitatively similar to what we have done for linear algebraic equations. So, before we wind up this particular uh, module, we look at uh, two important aspects. One was existence of solution of nonlinear algebraic equations and its relation to convergence of iterative methods. Okay. In the when we started studying linear algebraic equations, we began with the conditions for existence of solutions. We never talked about this when we started solving nonlinear algebraic equations. Here, I want to give a brief introduction to the conditions of existence of solutions and what is its relation to uh, convergence of iterative methods. We will look at uh, contraction mapping principle or contraction mapping theorem. We will apply it to uh, understand convergence of method of successive substitutions. We will also see uh, how contraction mapping principle can be used to analyze uh, Newton's method or Newton Raphson method. And with this, we have come to or we will come to an end of module 5, which is on solving nonlinear algebraic equations. So, we move on to the last tool that will be discussed in this course that is solving ordinary differential equations initial value problems. So, this is another fundamental tool which can be used to attack or to solve the transform problem. So, what are the learning objectives? Here as it is evident from a problem transformation module that many situations when you transform a problem you get ordinary differential equations initial value problems. So, this is one of the fundamental model class uh, model type or equation type which needs to be dealt with and we have to arrive at or we have to develop special methods to solve this class of problems. So, uh, in the beginning we will very briefly introduce the conditions for existence and uniqueness of uh, solutions of or, or ordinary differential equation initial value problem. This is very very brief introduction and then we immediately move to study of analytical solutions of linear ordinary differential equations in multiple variables. Well, you might wonder why am I doing this analytical solutions in a course which is meant to be for 
constructing numerical solutions. Well, this, this analytical solution part gives uh, in depth understanding how local solutions behave. Also, this is going to help us when we understand or when we analyze convergence behavior of numerical schemes for solving ODEIVP. So, as a background to develop numerical schemes, I am going to solve analytically linear ordinary differential equations given initial conditions. So, I will start with a scalar equation, move on to vector equations. And then uh, what is critical here is that I want to relate. Uh, so, what are these kind of equations? I am going to look at d x by d t is equal to a x, where a is a matrix. And then I want to understand relationship between the eigenvalues of matrix A and analytical solution of this differential equation d x by d t is equal to a x. Then actually you can get the eigenvalues of this matrix. I can qualitatively tell how the solution is going to behave asymptotically as time goes to infinity. So, just looking at the eigenvalues, we can analyze the behavior of the solutions and this elegant part we are going to study briefly. And then what is the relationship of linear equations and local linearization through Taylor series approximation is what we are going to look at here at end of this sub sub module. We now move to uh, the proper numerical methods for solving ODEIVP. So, before that we need to understand some basic concepts like marching in time. How do you develop a solution? You want to solve a problem, you want to integrate a differential equation from some time 0 to time infinity. You actually do it in small steps. This is marching in time. So, we will talk about this. If you look at the methods for solving uh, numerical methods for solving OD initial value problems, there are two classes. One is explicit methods, other are implicit methods. So, we will just have understanding of what is an implicit method, what is an explicit method and then we move on to study an important class of methods which is based on Taylor series approximation. Popularly these methods are known as Runge Kutta methods. They actually arise from Taylor series approximation and this is where I relate it to the approximation theory part that we have done earlier. So, we will actually derive here Runge Kutta methods starting from basics initially for a scalar case and then move on to the multivariate case. We then move on to the next important uh, method which is based on polynomial interpolation. So, again you will see that the ideas of ideas of approximation theory are playing a role when you are actually solving ordinary differential equation initial value problem. So, those ideas are so fundamental they just are everywhere in numerical analysis. Uh, so, we are going to study methods called as multi step methods okay, or popularly known as predictor corrector methods. Okay. We will develop, we will derive these algorithms starting from scratch, uh, starting from interpolation polynomials and first for the scalar case and see how they can be generalized to a multivariate case and then move on to solving initial value problems, ordinary differential equation initial value problems using orthogonal collocations. Well, after that we, we actually have a brief look at convergence analysis of numerical schemes for solving initial value problems, OD initial value problems and what is its relationship with selection of integration step size. When you are integrating nonlinear differential equations, one of the key things is how do you select integration step size. Okay. To get an understanding into this, we have to have uh, some understanding of uh, you know convergence analysis. So, we will analyze of course, linear ordinary differential equation initial value problems use and we will apply approximate solutions to these uh, linear problems. We already know their exact solutions and then we can compare exact solution with approximate solution and get insights. That is the reason I introduced analytical solution of linear OD IVP in the beginning. Then we will see how this can be extended to nonlinear uh, ODE IVPs. We will look at few concepts which are important in uh, uh, solving these equations like stiff ordinary differential equations. So, 
uh, stiffness of ODEs is what we will look at and then finally we will look at uh, what are called as variable step size implementation of these OD IVP schemes with accuracy monitoring. So these are all uh, involved uh, concepts of course most of the tools that you use today most of the programs that are available will have these built in tools you should know when to use which one to use why to use particular choice. Uh, if you have a stiff differential equation you should you should use a particular tool if you have you know uh, variables which are uh, which have too much difference in their time scales you should use variable steps as implementation and so on. So these these uh, things become very very important when it comes to um, in the end I am going to talk about uh, solving differential algebraic equations we have studied differential equations we have studied algebraic equations nonlinear algebraic equations just a brief look at how do you solve differential algebraic equations if they if they are encountered together uh, then we will look at a special method for solving ordinary differential equations boundary value problems uh, called method of sh or a shooting method. So actually you use a initial value problem solver to solve a boundary value problem okay. so how this is done we will look at this method and then again uh, we will look at uh, conversion analysis of solvers for ODIVP. So this brings us to an end of this uh, six modules introduction to this six modules. So if I want to sum up what is what is uh, you know overall learning objective in this course in this well first is you should know how to transform a mathematical problem at hand into a computable form using of course principles of approximation theory that is the almost half the course is, is devoted to that. Then understand basic properties of different tools particularly three different tools solving linear algebraic equations solving nonlinear algebraic equations and solving ordinary differential equations subject to or given initial values or initial conditions ODE IVPs understand different methods of different numerical schemes for solving these standard class of problems and understand their limitations. So that if you understand their limitations if you understand their strengths if you understand how they are developed you will be in much better position to employ them use them to concoct a recipe. Finally what I wanted to learn or to understand is that a numerical scheme is actually like a recipe and you are going to be a cook who will actually be able to cook a recipe a cook, a cook a recipe for a given problem. So you have these fundamental tools uh, you have some fundamental tools coming from approximation theory use a combination of them first uh, combination of tools from the approximation theory to transform the problem then you solve the transform problem using standard toolkits that you have okay. So this journey is going to be fairly long it is about 48 lectures and we begin our journey from the next lecture thank you.